Welcome out there on YouTube land to this relatively short video in which we discuss a topic that is actually fairly simple but yet not very well understood by a lot of people. It's very important if you're going to pick out a transformer with a particular voltage rating that you want for a amplifier circuit that you're building and will hopefully keep you from making a big mistake when you order the transformer uh, that is rated at 350 volts and yet when you hook it up in your uh, circuit it puts out 490 volts. Uh, such a disparity is sort of counterintuitive but let's see how this happens. Us old codgers can recall a time back in the 60's when cars uh, were sold with horsepower ratings that were generally very inflated. They would be peak horsepower ratings. I've seen lawnmowers that are reported as being like 10 peak horsepower. And we know when we start mowing the lawn or driving the car that the horsepower really isn't anywhere near what they told us it was. Uh, you can just tell by the performance. Now when we look at the output of a power transformer we can see where the disparity exists between peak and actual power output. The secondary output is going to be very highly peaked here with big gaping gaps in between those adjacent peaks. This reminds me of buying an ice cream cone and as you're eating it it looks like it's this big but there's a bunch of air uh, bubbles in the ice cream. So if you melted it down you'd find out that instead of this big of a scoop of ice cream you really had this big of a scoop. So to avoid misleading the customers, the transformer manufacturers used a mathematically derived term, a .707, that in effect, uh, if you multiply it times the peak output value, will melt it down just like the ice cream to give you a solid, smooth, unrippled DC output. So now when we're shopping for power transformers for our amplifier projects, we find that they're almost always advertised in RMS power output. So now say you're shopping for a power transformer for your amp project and you anticipate a needing 400 volts DC on the plates of your output tubes. Well, it seems natural then that you would go looking for a 400 0 400 power transformer. Uh, well, if you do, you're in for a grim surprise, and here is why. Once you get your amp circuit assembled and it starts to actually rectify and put out current, you're going to find that you have a much higher voltage output. In fact, it's going to be around 500 and 60 volts DC which will fry your output tubes. Now here's how that happens. Once the rippled DC output from your 400 0 400 power transformer reaches the filter caps, they're going to do something that is similar to what our RMS conversion factor did except it's going to do it in a different way the filter capacitor is going to charge up as each waveform is charged up to a higher voltage and then as the waveform voltage begins to drop off the capacitor is going to discharge and fill in the entire void between the two waves. It's not going to fill it in down here at the RMS level it's going to fill it in at the peak level. So what happened is that your power transformer, conservatively rated at 400 volts RMS, actually put out uh, 560 volt peaks. And then after rectification, your filter caps filled in the gaps between the waveforms to the 560 volt peak rather than the 400 volt RMS level. So when you're out shopping for transformers for your amplifier project, keep in mind that you may be buying a transformer rated at 250 volts RMS output, but when you hook it up in the circuit 
and connect it to filter capacitors, the actual DC output is going to be closer to 350 volts. We can round off the correction factor to around 1.4 times. So in each case, uh, say the probably the most common uh, power transformer, 325, 0, 325. It's actually 455 for each of those windings. The 400 uh, volt uh, power transformer for our full wave bridge rectifier, we're going to find that we actually get 560 volts DC out of it. All due to the effect of our filter capacitors on that rippled DC waveform. And now if that weren't bad enough, we add another complication. In a working circuit, after rectification and uh, with current flowing through the circuit, these values are going to be reduced. They're never going to be reduced uh, back to the RMS values, but in reality, within our amplifier, we're going to find that our uh, B plus is going to be somewhere in between these two numbers. And uh, I think we can boil it down to that the B plus level within your amp circuit is going to be based, of course, first off on the RMS uh, rating of your power transformer. Second, on the amount of current flowing in the circuit. Now, as the current goes up, the voltage goes down. As the voltage goes up, the current goes down. They are antagonistic. Uh, they're inversely related. Third is the type of rectification, and as we will see, the type of tube rectifier you use, uh, or even if you use diodes or tubes, is going to have a big impact on what your final B plus will be. And so I prepared this chart to give us a real world idea of what type of B plus we can expect based on the RMS rating of our a power transformer and the type of rectifier that we're going to use. Let's take a look. And over here are the actual amps that these values were taken from. Um, say we get a 340-0340 power transformer. We're going to use a 5U4. You can expect around 410 volts B+. Plus. Uh, now 330-0330. Look at this now, if I use a GZ34, I'm going to get 415 volts. Notice that with less voltage than the 5U4, I end up making higher B plus voltage. That's one of the reasons I really like the GZ34. It's a very efficient rectifier. Let's look at the wretched but venerable 5Y3. Give it 330 volts. And we're not going to get 410, we're not going to get 415, we're going to get 336. That shows you just how inefficient the 5Y3 is. God love it. Now, let's take that same 330 volts and use diode rectification. Look at this, 448 volts output. That tells you something about just how efficient diodes are, does it not? And let's give it a little less voltage. We go from 330 down to 320, and we get a little less output, but still very significant. And finally, when I was building my Supro Tremor Verb for the video series, and I had to pick out a power transformer, I decided, since I wanted around 360 volts on the plate of my 6V6 or 6L6, that using a 5Y3 rectifier, the 325-0325, power transformer would work best, and it did. So there's no real set conversion factors from RMS to actual real-world B+, simply because of the variation associated with the different types of rectifiers uh, or diodes that you use. You simply have to have a chart like this and then sort of extrapolate in between uh, how uh, you can get the voltage you need uh, from the proper transformer. Well, that about does it on this mercifully uh, short video on a generally misunderstood topic 
that uh, when misunderstood can end up costing you a lot of money and uh, smoking up the house pretty bad. So I hope that you enjoyed it and uh, benefited from it and will join uh, Rusty and me in future video releases. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. You know every once in a while after a hard day in the workshop, it's really nice to jump in the old Jeep and head for the desert. Of course, anytime you have a really nice open space like this, there's always some idiots who will turn it into a dump. Getting rid of old construction debris or big piles of God knows what, including derelict dishwashers. But once you get away from the pollution of humanity, you'll find that the desert is really a pristine and beautiful place. including some unusual and very colorful plants, scenic vistas, an old discarded roll of barbed wire, lots of old discarded railroad spikes, beautiful purple daisies, some beautiful cactus blooms, more scenic vistas, this is one of my favorite places to hike and explore. It's a juvenile sandstone, highly eroded uh, escarpment and uh, very picturesque. Here's a close-up. As you can see, it's absolutely beautiful, except for areas where idiots have taken it upon themselves to blemish it with their scrawling. May they rot in hell. As you can see, people tend to do a lot of shooting out here, but it's particularly on the weekend, and that's why I come out on weekdays so I can have the desert to myself. You couldn't ask for a clearer or bluer sky than this. Well, here's an interesting formation in the distance, uh, sort of a double-decker plateau. Here's an interesting spot, really eroded cliffs and formations, and a railroad track passing right through the middle of it. This formation is interesting because of the extremely deep cleft that's been eroded into the mountainside. There was a derailment here many years ago and this is about all that's left of a boxcar that came off the tracks. It's now become a haven for lizards. And here's the remains of a really old Southern Pacific phone booth. It reminds me of the giant artillery shell in Jules Verne's First Man on the Moon. Here's a pile of broken Edison battery oil bottles. You can see a signature on the side of this one. These were used by the railroad uh, for the batteries uh, for their telegraph and semaphores in remote locations. Uh, I have about, oh, I guess eight or ten really nice, complete original ones at home on display. Here's part of the ceramic lid from one of the battery jars. You can see down here Thomas and orange New Jersey. Here's an interesting and very old barbed wire fence anchor. These are placed every few hundred feet in a barbed wire fence to maintain vertical stability of all the single posts uh, and keep them from tipping over like a line of dominoes. Well, I guess it's time to hike back to the trusty Jeep and hit the road for home.
sweet. And now it's time to cross the silvery Rio Grande. Welcoming us home, little rusty.